Hi, my name is Shilin Patel and I'm from Duke University. I'm also a developer for the Internet 2 Grouper project. This is the admin track of the Grouper training. In this video, I'll be talking about the provisioning service provider, also known as a PSP, and this is part two. Here are the topics that I'll be covering in this part. In part one, I gave an introduction to the PSP and talked about how to install it with Grouper. In this part, I'll talk about some of the design decisions that you need to make before deploying the PSP. If you're provisioning to LDAP, this includes how you want to structure uh, your group objects in LDAP. You also have to consider whether you're going to use incremental provisioning, bulk provisioning, or both. And you have to consider which membership attributes to update in LDAP. After that, I'll talk a bit about some of the configuration options of the PSP. In part three of the PSP training, I'll give a demo of setting up LDAP provisioning. So one of the design decisions to make is whether group objects in LDAP should be represented as flat or bushy. These two screenshots show examples of how the objects would be structured in LDAP for both cases. In both of these examples, the same objects exist in Grouper. So Grouper has a folder called EDU. Under that, there's a folder called Courses. Under the EDU folder, there are two groups, Group A and Group B. And under the EDU colon Courses folder, uh, there's a group called Course A. With the flat structure, all the Grouper groups live directly under one OU. Uh, and the CN of each group is the full name or ID path of the group. With a bushy structure, which is the default, each folder in Grouper is represented as an OU in LDAP. The default value of the OU is extension or ID of the folder. So this isn't the full path. Folders within folders in Grouper are represented as OUs within OUs and groups and grouper are represented under the appropriate OU in LDAP. The CN of the group in this case is the extension or ID of the group rather than the uh, full ID path. The next design decision is whether to have incremental or bulk provisioning or both. Bulk provisioning will compare all the source data with all of the target data. Whatever differences that are found will be updated in the target. As you can imagine, if you have hundreds of thousands of groups in Grouper, this could be a very expensive operation. Uh, you can run the bulk provisioning using command line GSH or on a scheduled basis using the Grouper daemon. Incremental provisioning in Grouper is based on Grouper notifications, which is based on Grouper's change log. Incremental provisioning is an important option to consider if you need your targets to be updated very soon after a change is made in Grouper. Assuming that the incremental job is able to keep up uh, with your current rate of changes into Grouper, a change in Grouper should be reflected in the target within a minute or so. I've listed the change log actions that are supported by the incremental provisioning in the PSP as of version 2.1. The action names, for the most part, clearly describe when a change log event with that action is triggered. For instance, an add group event will happen when a group is added in Grouper, and since the PSP supports this, you can provision new groups to the target quickly. The add attribute assigned value and <clears throat> delete attribute assigned value events happen when attribute values are added or removed from an object in Grouper. This is using the new or style attribute framework in Grouper. The update group and update stem events happen, for instance, when a group or folder description is updated. In many cases, it may make sense to have both incremental and bulk provisioning set up. Incremental will give you quick updates and bulk will make sure that things stay in sync. If you're provisioning to LDAP, there could be a couple of ways to represent memberships. I should mention that different schemas and different types of directory servers use different attributes for different purposes. The information here is mainly considering open LDAP along with the default open LDAP configuration in the PSP. So for group objects that are populated in LDAP, you could populate the has member attribute. With the default open LDAP PSP config, uh, the values of this attribute would contain the names of subjects that are members of the group. This would be for both people and other groups that are members of the group. The isMember of attribute could also be populated with the names of groups that this group is a member of. In both of these cases, subject names are used rather than LDAP DMs. 
The member attribute is similar to the has member attribute, but it uses the LDAP entry DNs instead of the subject names. Again, these DNs can be for both people or other groups. And similarly, the member of attribute is similar to the is member of attribute, uh, but it uses DNs instead. You can also populate attributes for member objects in LDAP. Again, with the default config for open LDAP, the is member of attribute can contain the names of groups that this subject is a member of. And the member of attribute is similar, but it uses DNs instead. Some directory servers actually maintain the member of attribute automatically based on the member attribute of group objects. Active Directory is an example of this. Also, in the Oracle directory server, you can have a similar behavior except the attribute that contains the DNs of members is the is member of attribute instead of the member of attribute. So anyways, the PSP allows you to populate membership data in various different ways that you can customize. You have to make sure to populate it in the ways that make sense at your institution and follow the schemas that you're using with your directory server software. Now we'll talk a bit about the various configuration files that are part of the PSP. First, there's the LDAP.properties file. Here are some of the important parts to note in this configuration file. Um, you have to specify the LDAP connection settings first of all. The bind credential may point to a file on the file system with an encrypted password. You have to also specify the base DNs, uh, and you have to specify the base grouper stem to provision. So this allows you to provision only a subset of your grouper hierarchy uh, to the target. You can specify whether to provision using the flat or bushy structure. Uh, also, you can specify search result handlers, uh, which basically allows post-processing of LDAP search results. The default value is probably OK in most cases. Next, there's the psp.xml file. This contains the configuration for objects, identifiers, attributes, and references uh, to be provisioned to a target. It contains provisioning service object definitions for objects like groups, folders, and members. And it references the Shibboleth Attribute Resolver configuration to get source data. So for instance, if you want to provision a new attribute uh, for group objects, you would modify the PSO definition for groups and likely reference the attribute resolver to get the data from Grouper. If your provisioning structure is flat and you don't want to have stem rep stems represented as OUs and LDAP, you may want to remove the PSO definition for folders in this configuration file. I'll talk a bit about some of the parts of the PSO definitions now. First off, there's an attribute in the PSO element called authoritative which determines whether objects that don't exist in Grouper should be deleted from the target. In most cases, you probably want this to be true so that if the group or folder is deleted from Grouper, then it would also be deleted from the target. <clears throat> There's the attribute all source identifiers ref, which refers to the attribute resolver to get all source identifiers for that type of object. So for the case of groups, this should return the group names for all groups that should be provisioned to the target. Next, there are identifiers which identify target objects. Identifiers consist of a string ID, a target ID, and possibly a container ID. Uh, in this case, the group DN references the attribute resolver to return the LDAP DN of the group. Identifying attributes have a couple of different purposes. They're used to determine an object type in the target. So is a given entry in the target a group or a folder or something else? And it's also used to query all identifiers in the target for bulk provisioning. In this case, um, objects in LDAP are groups if they contain a specific object class value. The value there is, de is defined in the LDAP.properties file. The alternate identifier is used optionally to support renaming. The reference here is the old DN, um, again using the attribute resolver. If the alternate identifier is not provided and a rename is done, then the PSP would delete the old object and add the new object instead of renaming. Next, you have attributes in the PSO configuration to populate attributes in the target. Um, in this example, the description attribute would be populated for groups. 
the group description reference is based on the attribute resolver, which in the default config would return a group's description in grouper. Also, the PSO definition may have references to other objects. This is how the member and member of attributes are handled, for instance. For the member attribute, you can see here that it has two references to the attribute resolver. There's the members LDAP one, which returns members that are in your LDAP source by default. Um, and then there's the members GSA one, which returns members that are groups by default. So in the end, the member attribute would have members that are both people and uh, potentially other groups. By default, the memberships in LDAP are flattened out already, so you may not necessarily want the latter. You can simply remove that reference element in the XML um, if that's the case. So basically, you can add, remove, or modify um, attributes and references from the default config to meet the specific needs that you have at your institution. The next configuration file is the pspresolver.xml file, which is the configuration for the Shibboleth attribute resolver. This uses Shibboleth data connectors to retrieve source data. So in the case where the source is grouper, the data connectors would query data in grouper. The data may also be filtered. If you look at the data connectors in the default config, you'll see that many of them have filters to filter out provisioning of the Etsy folder in grouper. You can use filters to have some control over which objects get provisioned. This config also has attribute definitions. Um, attribute definitions produce a single attribute, uh, usually based on attributes and values from a data connector. They get referenced either internally in the file or in the psp.xml file that I talked about previously. The attribute definitions uh, may be as simple as returning one attribute as is from a data connector, or it may be more complicated, like getting an attribute from a data connector and reformatting it using a script. I've included a link here with more information on the attribute resolver. In part three of the PSP tutorial, I'll do a demo where I'll show some of this configuration. The PSP services.xml file contains configuration for Shilbola services, such as the attribute resolver, uh, the PSP, and the provisioning target. In the common case where you're provisioning grouper to a single LDAP target that matches your grouper subject source, you probably don't have to modify this file. However, if your LDAP target uh, isn't the same as your grouper subject source, or if you have multiple targets, uh, you'll probably have to modify this. Uh, but these are more advanced topics that I won't be covering in this tutorial. The PSP internal.xml file bootstrap shibboleth, and it's even more unlikely that you would need to modify this file. The last configuration file is the grouper loader.properties file. Uh, this file isn't specific to the PSP, but rather it's used by all the daemon processes in grouper. Uh, here you can configure incremental and bulk provisioning using the grouper daemon. In both cases, you can set the schedule for when uh, you want each of these jobs to run based off of a quartz cron syntax. For incremental, you can configure how to handle errors. Uh, if retry on error is set to false, then the PSP will ignore failures and just proceed with the next change. Uh, if it's set to true, then the PSP will retry failed changes until they succeed and only move on to the next change if the failure succeeds. Uh, for bulk provisioning, you can configure if you want it to uh, run when the daemon starts. Uh, you can also configure whether to emit individual diff and sync uh, responses in bulk responses. Uh, this is useful to conserve memory, especially if you know a lot of changes are going to be made. Uh, the grouper log files will contain individual operations regardless. Uh, so that's all for this tutorial. Uh, you can click on the quiz link in the video description to reinforce your knowledge of the PSP. And here are some links you can visit for more information. Thanks.